Everyone remembers O.J. Simpson's dream team as Johnny Cochran, Robert Shapiro, and F. Lee Bailey. But there are other lawyers on the case. Carl Douglas cross-examines Ron Schiff and tries to make him look like a liar and an alcoholic. Don't worry about that. Carl had a lot of important jobs. Johnny had originally given <coughs> Carl and I a number of witnesses to examine at the trial. <coughs> One of Carl's witnesses came first, which was Ron Schiff, and that was a particularly awful day for the defense. Wouldn't you agree that this statement about this supposed dream is a pretty bad thing about Mr. Simpson? Yes, it is. So did you lie when you didn't tell me about that dream? I sure did. You did. You lied a few times, haven't you, sir? Never in court. It's true, sir. That you were hopeful that you would be able to garner some publicity by making up false allegations about Mr. Simpson. No, it's not true at all. Did you think, sir, that by concocting this story about Mr. Simpson, it might enhance your own personal profile? Douglas, I put all my faith in God. Since Nicole's been dead, I felt nothing but guilt. My own personal guilt that I didn't do as much as I should have. But let me ask you this. Didn't you think that by being a witness in this case, it would enhance your own personal profile? No, sir. Aren't you an actor? Sir, I have done some acting. Let's talk about that. Isn't it true, sir, that by being the witness who has a conversation with Mr. Simpson, that it is going to possibly enhance your profile around the world? Oh, yes. You may answer the question. <clears throat> Mr. Douglas, there is no way, shape, or form that I would sit here and go through all this put my family through this for an acting career i could care less by doing question. acting you do realize mr ship that by testifying as you have you are going to enhance the name of ron ship around the world just like you're enhancing carl douglas by being mr attorney here you realize that too, right? So now you're a star as well. Well, I mean, that's, that's what everybody's, you know, that's what they say. People are going to see you. That's not why I'm doing this, Mr. Douglas. I'm doing this for my conscience, for my peace of mind. I would not have the blood of Nicole on Ron's ship. I, I can sleep at night, unlike a lot of them. Chris Darden had, had been recruiting me pretty pretty much, saying, hey, you know, you, you need to help us out. You need to testify with the stuff that you know. And I told him I didn't want anything to do with it. And Chris Darden did something that, that, that I thought was genius on his part because he called me down um, to the district attorney's office. I sat down and, 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 and he, someone said, hey, Chris, you got a phone call. And he's going, oh, okay. And he gets up and he, and he walks away. And I look and I sit there and I see this, this, what I knew was a homicide book, you know, and, and Ron and Nicole. And I just opened it up. And I looked at the pictures of Ron and I looked at the pictures of Nicole. And when I saw the pictures of her, I mean, that, that just ripped me to shreds. I just went, man, this is like really, really crazy. And then when Chris came back, you know, and I just looked at him and said, you know, I'll testify. And he goes, huh? I said, I'll testify. I'll testify. You did it true, sir, that Simpson never said anything to you about there being blood found in the car? No, it's not true. Isn't it true, sir, that Mr. Simpson said nothing to you about blood being found in the house? That's not true. Isn't it true, sir, that you mentioned to Mr. Simpson that the police had found a glove on his property? I had no idea what they found in that house. Nothing. Did you take Mr. Simpson out to behind the, the garage to show him the area where the glove was supposedly found? This is sad, OJ. But no, this is really sad. Your Honor, I'm going to strike that. Ladies and gentlemen, you are just to disregard 
Leadership's direct comment to the Senate. Please, you're instructed not to do that. Ron Schiff just looked over at OJ at one point and just started talking directly to him as if no one else was in the room. It was just this, like, very real moment. And that was on Carl's watch. And it wasn't Carl's fault, but it caused OJ to insist that the second tier lawyers not get to examine any other witnesses. You drink a lot, don't you? I used to. You've had a drinking problem, haven't you? Yes, yes I have. Your alcohol problem started when? When I was a police officer. About what year did the problem start? I guess they probably kind of got out of hand, I think, around. Maybe 83. And you believe that your alcohol problem ended when? Uh, probably when I left the police department. Which would have been 89. 89. You were suspended for 30 days while you went to the academy, were you not? No, I was not. Wasn't there occasion, sir, when you came to the academy with alcohol in your breath? Yes, there was. Did you receive a discipline as a result of that conduct? Yes, I did. What was that discipline? I received 15 days suspension. When you say, Mr. Ship, that you didn't have a drug problem, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, an alcohol problem after 1989, are you saying by that that you have not been drunk since 1989? I'm saying, to me, a drinking problem. Let me explain this. You know, when I did have a drinking problem, I was the one that told myself, according to all my friends and family, everybody was shocked. It was me. It was my standards. I respect that, but my question is, you still have gotten drunk since 89, haven't you? I'd say yes. Were you and he close friends? I'd say we were pretty good friends. We didn't never went out to dinner like on a regular basis or something like that. Did you ever go out to dinner with him and you? Ever? Well, when he was trying to have me help him get back with Nicole, he was wrong. You and he went out to dinner? He took me out a, a couple of times. O.J. Simpson is a football fan, isn't he? Yeah, that's what he's doing. He goes to games a lot, doesn't he? You and O.J. Simpson have never attended a football game together never. in the 26 years that he's been your supposed friend, have you? Not one. You're not really this man's friend, are you, sir? Well, I, okay. All right. If you want me to, to really explain it, I guess you can say I was like everybody else, one of his servants. I did police stuff for him all the time. I ran license plates. That's what it was. Okay, I mean, I, like I said, I love the guy. You weren't the kind of friend that he would share some private secrets with, were you, sir? Right, so Nothing except for the 1989 beating. Where he needed me. I hated Carl Douglas for a long time. I really did. I mean, I, I, I the word hate in my mind was Carl Douglas. So I really did. Mr. Ship uh, continually was staring at us. I found it myself to be very, very uncomfortable. As week two of the O.J. Simpson trial continues, the defense calls out prosecution witness Ron Shipp for behaving inappropriately in front of the jury, specifically accusing him and some of the family members of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown of exchanging congratulatory gestures after he finished his testimony. This is Goldman gesturing to Ron Shipp and telling him what a wonderful job she did and going like he did and going like this while the jury was sitting right there. She made the thumbs up gestures. Yeah, and she, she was also talking very loud and she said, Ron, you did a great job. Like that. So Mr. Ron Ship uh, left the witness stand. Uh, he walked through the gate there and he made uh, what is called a power sign for the Brown family. This was seen by people in the back row. And uh, the jury was apparently still here. The court uh, needs again perhaps to inquire or check with your staff or check with the photographer in the back row. While you were uh, 
directing your attention to Council Sidebar. I was conferring with uh, Mr. Simpson, and Mr. Shipp uh, continually was staring at us, was mouthing some type of word uh, in, a, in some type of attempt to either communicate with me or with Mr. Simpson, uh, was making very unusual facial expressions. Uh, that would go from a grimace to a smirk, to a uh, smirk, and uh, it was in front of the jury, and I found it, uh, I found it myself to be very, very uncomfortable, and I tried to direct my attention away from him. What I saw was a witness who didn't know where to look. He didn't want to sit there and stare at the jury. He could not stare at the audience, so he was looking around, as is typical of a witness when the attorney is at sidebar. I didn't see him make any unusual expressions, other than those typical and consistent of a, with a witness who is just trying to determine what to do while the attorneys are at sidebar. All right, well, if we have any luck, maybe Court TV has the, uh, has the focus on uh, Mr. Shipper in court. the defendant while we were at sidebar and he told me that yes in fact he did and uh, I intend to ask him on redirect what it was since it was done in the presence of the jury uh, we, we, we would like I'd like to ask that you excuse me the jury saw it I'd like to know what it is he said to him I'd like him to know what it is he said to him I don't think that's proper your honor that's not evidence and I think the court can simply admonish I'm going to admonish and communications between a witness and a defendant during the course of the trial I don't think are relevant to anything unless there's something highly unusual. I'm not going to get into that in front of the jury. All right, let's have the jury's please. Okay, hold on. What did he say, Mr. Darden? Did you offer proof? He said, tell the truth. I had objection. <laughs> Ron Shipp's testimony is a dramatic example of different perspectives covering the Simpson trial. The national media reports it one way. The African-American media, led by the L.A. Sentinel, reports it another. The Sentinel saw itself as an advocate for the black community, and it um, presented viewpoints that one wouldn't typically see in the pages of the L.A. Times. Consider this. This is the L.A. Times coverage of Shipp's testimony. The foundation of journalistic practice is this idea of reporting facts. And facts are things that can be verified with evidence of various sorts, and that you know two different observers should come away with the same understanding if indeed it's a fact. Now compare that with the LA Sentinel's treatment of the same testimony. Obviously, that's a very different perspective than, say, the one that the LA Times took. They saw the police officer ship as, as possibly a race traitor who, again, as a part of the police force, who has been known to do um, things to um, um, convict blacks who um, maybe weren't deserving of conviction. And the fact that, you know, he had a drinking issue and she had, it, it was more fuel to the fire. So, again, different frames brought to the same testimony um, um, lead to radically different interpretations of what it means. Your Honor, I have here what appears to be the LAPD 911 incident report. May it be marked equals 20. to the last week of April 1992 at about 11.30 p.m. Did you see the defendant at that time? Yes, I did. Where were you when you saw the defendant? I was in my upstairs bedroom. And where was the defendant when you saw him? He was on the sidewalk. Hello. What did you see the defendant do? 
I saw him walking around on the sidewalk, walking from Shetland up Gretna Green, slowly. How long did the man remain on the sidewalk? The man you identified as the defendant. All the time that my husband was downstairs. How much time was that? Two or three minutes. Did your husband call 911? Yes, he did. What happened next? I went to tell him that it was OJ. My name is Carl Colby. What caused you to call 911? Well, it was an evening, uh, approximately 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. And it's a very, it's a residential neighborhood, very quiet. And sometimes before retiring, I look, just go check the locks and look around downstairs, make sure the lights are off, things like that. And I happened to look outside and I saw a man um, outside on the sidewalk. And what was that man doing? He was standing on the sidewalk looking at what apparently was the residence next door. What did you see the man do after you called 911? He went back to the original position and looked upon at the residence and then um, left. After I'd made the call, I recognized him. And who was that man? It was Mr. Simpson. Well, I was embarrassed that I'd called 911 because I didn't feel that uh, Mr. Simpson was a threat to, to me or to, uh, to anyone else in our neighborhood. It came down to a stalker, and the stalker was Simpson. So he would give himself two or three hours to see what she's going to do and who she has come over to her place, and he would spy on her. against O.J. Simpson, and to hear his wife, his ex-wife, so terrified, so afraid, um, in one of the calls where she's screaming and she's saying, he's going to kill me, and then contrast that actually with the other call, the second call, where she almost sounded resigned. Yeah, Was that priority code upgraded at some point? Yes. And who upgraded the uh, the priority of that that call? I did. What did you upgrade it to? I upgraded it to cold too high, which is now potentially life threatening. <laughs>
October 25, 1993, around 10 p.m., did you respond to a 9-11 uh, call for help? Uh, not for help, but I did respond to a 9-11 call. And did you respond to 325 South Gretna Green? Yes, sir. The home of Nicole Brown? Yes. Why did you go to that location? Um, the 911 call uh, stated it was a uh, domestic dispute. It was uh, marked code too high, which is uh, uh, an, an, an urgent call. She was, uh, was visibly shaken. She was upset. Uh, she was concerned and uh, she was scared. The door had been uh, split uh, at the near the top and bottom of the door. Describe her up, if you will, the defendant's demeanor when you saw him in the rear yard. Uh, the defendant was agitated. He was uh, upset, pacing back and forth, and uh, he was speaking loudly. of her and these recordings of her and her telling people that she was afraid for her life it, almost like she was speaking from the grave and it really uh, impacted me emotionally um, but when they interviewed the jurors who were dismissed after that they said that they didn't think it had any relevance to the case and so the impact on the jury was not the same as the impact maybe on some of the reporters or some people in the public. And I found that to be really, really impactful and really, really sad and haunting. Friday afternoon, February 3rd, Nicole's older sister, Denise, testifies. Her physical resemblance to her late sister is striking, and her raw anger and hostility to her former brother-in-law is palpable. Denise Brown, D-E-N-I-S-E-B-R-O-W-N. Ms. Brown, you are Nicole Brown's older, older sister? Yes, I am. Do you have other sisters? Yes, I do. How many? There's Dominique and Tanya, and of course, Nicole. You know the defendant seated here at the end of council table? Yes, I do. Is your former brother-in-law? Yes, he is. When did you first meet the defendant? Uh, back in 1977. And where was he when you met him? He was playing uh, football for Buffalo. Was your sister Nicole and the defendant dating back then in 1977? Yes, they were. Was the defendant married at that time? Yes, he was. Ms. Brown, your sister Nicole married the defendant in February 1985? Yes, she did. Did you attend the wedding? Yes, I did. I was the maid of honor. Did you, uh, your sister Wendy, your sister Nicole, and Juliana, the four of you, and the defendant, went out and went to the Red Onion in Santa Ana? Yes, we did. Did anything unusual happen that night in, in the Red Onion? Yes. <laughs> what was that? <clears throat> well, we all started, well, we were all drinking and goofing around and being loud and dancing and having a great time. And um, then at one point, OJ grabbed Nicole's crotch and said, this is where babies come from, and this belongs to me. And uh, Nicole just sort of wrote it off like it was nothing, like, you know, like she was used to that kind of treatment. And um, it was like, I thought it was really humiliating, if you ask me. And when he said that, and when he grabbed her the crotch, were there, were there people around? Oh, yeah, the bar was packed. Strangers? Yeah. Yeah, he was talking to the strangers. Did the defendant appear mad or angry or upset when he, when he grabbed his sister's crotch and, and made these statements in front of these strangers? No. No. He wasn't angry. It was his. That's the way he, he, just the way he acted, the way it was like, this belongs to me, this is mine. He wasn't angry when he said it, he just made it a point. 
He wanted it to be known. And during the time that, that these strangers were, were approaching him, shaking hands and things like that, did he appear to shy away from the attention at all? Oh, no. No, not at all. He loves the attention. He loves it. He's got a big ego. He eats his ego. In this regard, the last answer regarding the defendant's ego, that question and answer is not relevant to the issue before the court at this time. And Ms. Brown, if I can ask you, would you please listen carefully to the question that the attorneys asked of you? And if you would answer just the precise questions that they ask you, this will go a lot easier. All right, thank you. You recall an occasion when you and Ed McCabe and Nicole and the defendant went out to dinner? Yes, I do. And where did the four of you go after you left? On Rockingham? Yes. Have you ever had something to drink at the restaurant before? And what did you do when you returned to the defendant's home on Rockingham? We were sitting at the bar talking, having some more drinks, and talking. And while you were talking, did you say something to the defendant? Yes, I did. What did you say to him? I told him he took Nicole for granted. And he blew up. Ms. Brown, if you would, don't volunteer anything about the answer. You told the defendant that he took Nicole for granted? Yes. Why did you tell him that? <laughs> what reaction, if any, was there by the defendant when you told him that he took your sister Nicole for granted? He got extremely upset. He started yelling at me. I'll take her for granted. I do everything for her. I give her everything. And he continued. And then a whole fight broke out. And pictures started flying off the wall. Clothes started flying at ran the stairs, got close, started flying uh, down the stairs. And uh, grabbed Nicole, told her to get out of his house. Wanted us all out of his house. Picked her up, threw her against the wall. Picked her up, threw her over there. the raw emotion of denise brown's testimony closed week two of the oj simpson trial a week the prosecution painted a picture of domestic violence that led to murder in week three denise brown continues her testimony describing the hours before her sister is murdered including the demeanor of the man accused of killing her that's next on oj 25 I'm Roger
trial of the century. It's called the People vs. O.J. Simpson. It's called simply the Simpson trial. But there is nothing simple about it. At its essence, it is a search for justice in the murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. What it becomes is a point in history where you remember exactly where you were when you heard the verdict. I'm Roger Cossack, and this is OJ25. on behalf of the people or the prosecution prepared to proceed yes your honor we are all right you may proceed thank you very much good morning ladies and gentlemen in this trial just like every trial some evidence has been presented to you that really is not relevant to answer the core question of who murdered ron goldman and nicole brown and it's up to you the jury to weed out the distractions weed out the sideshows and determine what evidence is it that really helps me answer this question let me summarize for you what we have proven we have the bruno molly shoe prints all of them size 12 his size shoe all of them consistent going down the bundy walk I observed some what appeared to be uh, bloody shoe sole prints on the ground on the concrete we have the bundy blood trail we have his blood to the left of the bloody shoe prints. When you got to the rear gate, did Detective Phyllis point anything out to you? Pointed out what appeared to be a blood transfer or a smear on the upper rung of the gate and what appeared to be uh, two uh, droplets of blood on the lower inside rung of the rear gate. We have the blood in the Bronco, his and Ron Goldman. The results of 31, are they clearly a mixture? It is consistent with the defendant and is consistent with Mr. Goldman. Yes, it is. We have the Rockingham blood trail off the driveway, in his bathroom, in the foyer. Seeing that blood drop obviously triggered the fact that I've seen what appeared to be a blood trail leaving the crime scene at uh, Bundy. We have the Rockingham gloves. It appeared to be somewhat uh, moist or sticky. It appeared that parts were sticking to other parts of the glove. There was Mark Furman acting like a choir boy, making you believe he was the best witness that walked in here. Generally applauded for his wonderful performance. It turns out he was the biggest liar in this courtroom during this process. You're a criminal defense attorney and you have a tough case. This is what you do. You argue the law. And if the law is against you, you argue the facts. And if the facts are against you, you raise hell and blame somebody else. When the facts and the law are against it, blame the police, blame the prosecution, point the finger elsewhere, create a smoke screen. And that's what they've done in this case, ladies and gentlemen. Smoke and mirrors. I think it's been hard for all of us to be here and to listen to all of the evidence. In this case, evidence that proves Mr. Simpson is guilty because none of us wanted to believe it. We all wanted to believe that our image of him was right. And we all know that we never knew him exactly, but we kind of felt like we did. And it's really kind of hard to have to believe that the man we saw in the movies and the commercials could do that. But he did. So much of the essential facts in this case are just shot through with reasonable doubt. There is something wrong. There's something terribly wrong about this evidence. Somebody manufactured evidence in this case. There's missing blood. There's EDTA. There's questions, serious, deeply troubling questions. You must distrust it. You have to distrust it. Usually I feel like I'm the only one left to speak for the victims, but in this case, Ron and Nicole, they're speaking to you. They're speaking to you. And they're telling you who murdered them. Nicole started before she even died. Remember back in 1989, she cried to Detective Edwards, she's going to kill me. 
He's gonna kill me. I said, well, who, who is gonna kill you? She said, OJ. I said, uh, OJ who? Uh, did you mean the, the football, football player, OJ the football player? She said, yes, OJ Simpson the football player. 1990, she made a safe deposit box. Put photographs of her beaten face and her haunted look in a safe deposit box along with a will. She was only 30 years old. You told us a moment ago that you took these photographs, is that correct? Yes, I did. Could you describe for us, please, the circumstances that led to your taking these photographs? Nicole asked me to take them for. How many 30 year olds you know do that? A will, a safe deposit box? It's like writing in the event of my death. He knew. He's gonna kill me. This is OJ Simpson. One day in court. By your decision, control his very life in your hands. Treat it carefully, treat it fairly. Be fair. Don't be part of this continuing cover up. Do the right thing, remembering that if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And if these messengers have lied to you, you can't trust their message. But this has been a search for truth. All right, let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Although the brutal and callous way in which Ron and Nicole were murdered may understandably make you feel sorrow, pity, and anger. CNN. Guilty just because he felt sorry for them. On the other hand, although it would be completely understandable if you were to feel angry and disgusted with Mark Furman, as we all are, still it would be wrong to find the defendant guilty, not guilty, just because of that anger and disgust. Perhaps at some time, since 1985 or 6, you address a member of the African American race as a. Is it possible that you have forgotten that act on your part? No, it's not possible. Are you therefore saying that you have not used that word in the past 10 years, Detective Firm? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Did he lie when he testified here in this courtroom saying that he did not use racial epithets in the last 10 years? Yes. Can you tell us how you feel about testifying today? Nervous. Is he a racist? Yes. He said, if I had my way, I'd gather all the would be gathered together and burned. He said, the only good is a dead. Is he the worst LAPD has to offer? Yes. Who said that? Officer Mark Furman. And that was his voice. Is that right? Yes. Officer yes, Freeman turned around, looked at me, and told me, I told you we'd get you. Was the testimony that you gave at the preliminary hearing in this case completely truthful? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Have you ever falsified a police report? I wish to assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. Do we wish that this person was never hired by LAPD? Yes. Should LAPD have ever hired him? No. It actually made me laugh. It was so far off the deep end, it was comical. I stole her little prize, and she was having a fit. In fact, do we wish there were no such person on the planet? <laughs> I believe she said she wished I was never born. Wow, that hurt so bad. The fact that Mark Furman is a racist and lied about it on the witness stand does not mean that we haven't proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. When she gets up and gives her final... Till next time. And you understand that the prosecutor...